Okay, so we are live. Welcome everybody to another exciting episode of Music, Philosophy and More. And on today's show, uh, we have my good friend, Konstantin Mediuk, the bass Hi, everybody. player. And the bass player and the uh, overall wonderful human being. <laughs> Thank so, you very much. I've been called worse. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to uh, we're going to pick your brain a bit, Khan, about uh, you know your musical history, and I'm sure we're going to uh, take side side streets down uh, philosophy as it comes, and um, then you know any common memories that we stumble upon, I'm sure we'll just explore those together. Sounds great. So. <clears throat> um, Yes, yeah, so I apologize to everyone that we had to cancel our first uh, talk together with Constantine, but um, we're back and we're ready. And it's the 17th of May, which is uh, Norwegian Independence Day. So, oh, can... <laughs> happy, happy Norwegian Independence Day. Yes. Thank you. So, yeah, yeah. 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 so, uh, so the Norwegians are happy about seeing Khan on this day, although I guess it's tomorrow for them already. So, uh, I'm, All right, very so, happy, I'm very happy for the country of Norway. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they produce they produce their share of good music too. Yes, they 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 produce you. They're, they're responsible for you know some of their blood flows through your veins, right? So mm -hmm. yeah. yep, on, on this half of my body, oh, yeah. on, <laughs> only side. only the right half, yeah. <laughs> your left half. <laughs> my right, your left. <laughs> All right. So um, so let's start uh, kind of. At the beginning, if that's cool. Uh, so, yeah, Khan, can you tell us? Do you remember when you started getting into music? What was it? Was there a moment, or was it just this kind of natural path with your family, or yeah, how did that happen? I, you know, I, I think like, like my my parents told me when I was like like a really tiny toddler, like one of the first things out songs I was singing, like walking around the apartment, was like Radio Gaga by uh, by Queen, you know. Oh, yeah. And I was like, Radio Gaga, Radio Gugu. And uh, the song was in English, obviously. Somehow Queen, I guess, made their way across the Iron Curtain. Mm -hmm. I was born in, uh, in, in 81 and in what was then Soviet Union, you know, and now it's U Ukraine. And uh, so some, some, I guess, uh, things were safe, I guess, uh, deemed safe by communists. So it was, the music was allowed to come across mm -hmm. and some wasn't. So like... Uh, like Pink Floyd, I guess, and the Queen and, and Elton John and Billy Joel were, were deemed safe because I remember my dad having like the vinyls of, of you know, of, of those artists. But some things were definitely like not safe, like like Michael Jackson and, and, and Whitney Houston and Prince were definitely like hmm. totally forbidden. So, uh, hmm. so to me, so I grew up, I guess, uh, listening the very first music I can remember listening to is stuff that my dad would put on, which would be like, Pink Floyd or Queen, you know, or like some some Elton John, I guess, like in the eighties, and and I could definitely tell the difference between the stuff that my grandma, may she rest in peace, would listen to on the like on the radio, which was all all Soviet and very much like um, not a lot of depth, just just a lot of like because it was like if you were on Soviet radio, you had to be like approved by the government, so it was all songs about. Oh, the sun is shining, and uh, you know, and and everything's great, you know. Or it was just really somber songs about World War II, because uh -huh. you know, for a large part of the world, large part of Europe, World War II was uh, you know this paradigm shift. Like the world was never the same, and a lot of art and music was uh, even 40 years later, right in the 80s, 40 years after the war ended, it was still affected everybody very deeply. So, um, so all the songs and all the movies were just either like like about the war or post-war or everything or this really like meaningless drivel that's approved by the government like happy-go-lucky kind of stuff <laughs> uh and even even if they were love songs they were very like neutered kind of love songs you know so that was like mm -hmm. the soviet music so i yeah. always kind of gravitate from the early towards like i guess like queen and pink floyd and like all, all the stuff that uh I'm like, wow, this is cool. I can't understand what they're saying, you know, so it must be cool. <laughs> and uh, and I guess, uh, I don't know, even to this day, I think I appreciate uh, stuff that's like sung in different languages because you can fill in your own blanks and you can, sometimes it's, you know, when you actually know what they're talking about, it's 
it's less interesting <laughs> it's less interesting you know and, and like you know maybe we'll talk about it later but like something that you know like we both love the benamorphous right for example right or like like a lot of death metal so sometimes when someone's like just screaming whether it be in key or just it's really guttural and i don't understand every single word but it just kind of flows to me it's more i get in the zone a little bit more versus mm -hmm. if it's like you know as much as i love metallica like you know sometimes yeah huh? you know? <laughs> give me fire give me fuel you know, right like, honk honk <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah exactly whereas if it's more like, this kind of stuff it's just uh I, I can feel it more you know what i mean i'm, I'm turning off my conscious mind trying to uh, imbue some meaning into these lyrics you know and i'm just letting the music take me kind of like where it is so yeah. um there, so there are some there are some de uh, death metal bands that that are actually surprisingly um, clear, right? Like you can actually hear the lyrics. I, yeah. I don't know, is Cannibal Corpse like that? I feel like they know yeah, yeah. those. Cannibal Corpse, like their current singer, uh, George Fisher, he's um, he's much more, he enunciates uh, <laughs> a lot more uh, <laughs> than their their first singer, and uh, which is good and bad. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Yeah, you don't need to hear their lyrics. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the musicality of it and the energy, I think, is something that's, uh, you know, I, I think to me is like I I find it very like to me it's undeniable. You know, it's it's uh, I think like at the core of it, I think if it's good music, you know, I think it's it really transcends language or it even transcends um, e even what I think at its core, like like if you compare it to like. Like I was in Germany for a month, maybe over 20 years ago. And over there, even if you're not into a particular kind of beer, right? Mm -hmm. Like say you only like lagers, right? And they give you the something that's a really dark beer, right? You drink it, but because it's German beer and people have been doing it for like hundreds, if not thousands of years, you can still appreciate the quality of that beer, even though it's not like your GM, so to speak, right? <laughs> so I think with, with good music, people can can appreciate if they just let themselves do it they can appreciate good music even if they don't understand the words like i didn't like back in the 80s or even mm -hmm. if they're not into the particular type of music like i'm not i don't seek out for example jazz right but if something comes on and it's a great piece of music i can appreciate for what it is you know and i can stop what i'm doing or continue what i'm doing and let it kind of inspire me because i can just take it for what it is i can just kind of plug in and let this energy kind of flow through me without uh, you know being very hung up on oh this is jazz you know like, oh. <laughs> you know like it's mm -hmm. so the same thing with the death metal it's like it, i think it's it, it, there's a lot of stuff that's i think on purpose off-putting like like you know just like punk rock it's meant to be antagonizing it's not meant to be mainstream right but if you explain to somebody if you break it down to somebody just the musicality of it you know or the energy of it i think a lot more people would kind of give it a chance you know um, yeah. if, if you just get past that first kind of, that first layer, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, no, I definitely, I know. Like trying an oyster for the first time, you know what I mean? You kind of have to close your <laughs> eyes. <and> like... <laughs> yeah, right. And you don't have to, it's not a, it's not a requirement, but it's... <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, no, totally. I was, um, I'm doing, working on the second edition of my book, uh, Music Flot, sorry, Music for Health. Yeah, I put out that ebook and I'm working on the paperback. So a second edition, I'm changing some things and adding yeah. stories. And I was sharing with my mother about some of it. And we're talking, I was explaining, so I divide music into three basic categories in the book, yes. which are healthy, unhealthy, and gray area. Yeah. So um, I would say the vast majority of music that we have access to in daily basis is gray area. So yeah. you have to use your wisdom and how, yeah. you know, and, and the gray area is going to be bad for some and, and really good for others, you know, so, yeah. and, and it could be a mix for, for most people. Yeah. So, but at the same time, like, so I was defining, like, I was actually talking about a concert I went to, which was very violent. And I would say that it's unhealthy music. Uh, you probably like the band. I don't know, but I'm not a big fan of the band, but I would still turn on a song. Yeah. Conscious, conscientiously. Yeah, for that vibe, for that experience. And, uh, you know, so I put in there something when I was just defining unhealthy music, I was explaining that I also, because I'm a lover of music and, you know, uh, and open minded, I feel it's necessary to listen to anything that people really want to show me, even if I suspect it's yeah. not good for me. 
and then you know i'll just use my judgment and yes you know but i think it's important to to give it a shot to try to find that kernel of truth if someone loves what you know cannibal corpse for example i'm not into but yeah you know if someone really likes them i would listen and say why this way yeah. i can relate and <clears throat> you know i think it is growing there and it's also important to know if something's bringing you down you know yeah so you know is that's just what's been on my mind and I, Absolutely. it's fun looking at these connected stories like how to yeah where in my life did i really learn what unhealthy music is where did i learn what healthy music is what i would call healthy you know yeah music that enriches like kind of sound healing almost yeah uh, exactly yeah i think like music definitely has has healing like uh has healing properties i think it's it's you know i, I think it's really the divine sometimes speaking through through the music you know you just gotta you know a lot of just you know and reading a lot of people who are like songwriters you know if you ask them like like somebody like randy newman right so he's he's uh like you got a friend in me like randy newman right he's uh mm -hmm. so he i read this interview with him and he's like no i i he considers music to be work so he works from nine to five so he wakes up in the morning has breakfast sits at his piano picks up whatever he was working on at 4.49 the previous day, <laughs> continues writing it. If he finishes a song, he's like, okay, on to the next one, continues. And if it's like 4.59, he doesn't finish a song, he's like, he'll just write something down. He's like, okay, I'm done for the day. And then, but most people, they say like, no, I'm struggling for hours. And then some, suddenly something amused comes to me and it's like, it works mm -hmm. through me. And I think for more people, either by themselves, like figuring stuff out or in jamming with other people and bouncing ideas off of each other. I think yeah. most people are not like Randy Newman and most people, there's something yeah. flowing through the ether and it like it, it comes and it maybe possesses you and like, and it comes out through you. So I think that there's, and it can be healthy or it can be very unhealthy. I think it's, uh, I think it depends, you know, where you are emotionally, mentally, spiritually, right? And, uh, and what are you using it for? I think, mm -hmm. You know, if you think of something like some kind of piece of like, like really like bad pop music that's just singing about like, I don't know, just like, like being promiscuous, right? And now you're, you're, you're pumping it over the airwaves to a bunch of kids who are too young to understand what it is. Mm -hmm. I mean, that could be, that could be worse than any like uh, death metal song, right? Or worse than anything, <laughs> because like now you're, you know what I mean? You're, because it's very catchy. Mm -hmm. you know because it's written by a team of professionals you know what i mean and, mm -hmm. and that could be um to me that would be like an example of something that's really unhealthy you know what i mean something that's it's an earworm and gets inside like uh, inside mm -hmm. of you and and you're putting these ideas in people's heads impressionable people and i'm talking about you know and then you know and then you use it for like marketing use it to sell t-shirts or whatever you know it's mm -hmm. oh yeah like, uh, normalizing this kind of yeah. really really warped behavior that pop music normalizes exactly exactly and it's and, and it's you know and, and and then and then you have kids who are like very impressionable and when i say kids i don't mean like toddlers but maybe toddlers if they hear something catchy and they're dancing to it but it's not like queen or or beatles or uh, you know or billy joel it's something that's mm -hmm. singing about you know shaking your ass you know or something like and that that's I don't know. the bottom line yeah <laughs> yeah i don't mean to curse on, 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 yeah you know? no, it's, it's fine yeah but, but you know what i mean what's to me it can be something that can be healthy if you know if if a grown-up can like you know if they enjoy it whatever but it can be unhealthy because it's you know it gets inside and then it's what does mm -hmm. it do you know it's it's yeah, yeah that's interesting I, in in the book i i classified pop uh, as gray area because yeah. probably because i sensed a lot of people wouldn't wouldn't really reckon identify with as it as unhealthy yeah but, you know when you say it for me i, I largely am a lot of pop music does make me sick to my stomach really yeah. especially the ones that came out in the past uh, 10 to 20 years yeah uh, i like i've really been looking into it to try to yeah give it a chance a lot of it's true trash true garbage yeah. I won't name names, but like despicable. Yeah. So, you know, I, yeah, I mean, but pop, there is a lot of pop that's certainly, you know, great. Like Michael Jackson's pop too, right? So, yeah, yeah. I wouldn't call him unhealthy, but I certainly wouldn't call him healthy music. You know, yeah. it's, it's so much. Uh... Anyway, so anyway, back to you. We're, yeah. we're in Ukraine. What city was it? Uh, so, Ky Kiev, which is the capital city. So, mm -hmm. I so I was born in Kiev and I grew up just, just outside of it. So, I guess like, 
like if Kiev is to New York, so where I grew up is kind of like Rockville Center. You know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> so uh, and I, I didn't uh, I didn't have any aspirations to to play music, you know, when I was a kid or and. I came to United States when I was 12, going on 13. So like, I just celebrated my uh, my 27th anniversary of being in the United States, May 6th. Oh, wow. Oh, awesome. Yeah, so awesome. <laughs> I love, I love this country with all my heart, you know, like for real. Um, and so here, when I was a teenager, you know, I kind of like, you know, you're a teenager, you start listening to like, I'm gonna listen to my music, you know, I'm not gonna like, <laughs> what mm. my parents listen to is lame, you know? So I kind of, uh, for me, I guess, uh, you know, one of the bands that I like got into was I. This is like mid '90s, so like Nirvana. I got into Nirvana. I got into U2, and from there like Metallica, and then Pantera, and then, and so I kind of got into those are my my kind of gateway bands, and and I remember, so and, and like thinking about picking up a guitar, you know, and. So my dad is a classically trained musician. He went into in a, he he plays five instruments, you know, and he he was never like really encouraging or discouraging uh, like to play. He's just kind of like, okay, do your own thing, whatever. So, um, but to him, his relationship with music is weird because so he born and raised and still living in so in what was then Soviet Union, now is Ukraine, and over there you get um, I, I guess the way the system works. From an early age, you get identified as like what you're good at. And then mm -hmm. you get placed in a specialized school. So if you're if you're very athletic, they put you in a school, and over there there's no separation like elementary, middle school, high school. Mm -hmm. So you um, so you go to the same school for 12 grades. So if you show proclivity towards being athletic at like five or six years old, they put you. You go through these tests, and then they put you in into this like sports school where you have all the basic subjects that you get in a regular school, but with a heavy emphasis on athletics and from there if you're good enough that's how you go towards being a professional athlete or and to represent you know mother russia right <laughs> and and if not then you know you, you you do something else in the field so my dad i guess when he was really young he's he showed some some proclivity towards music so you get put in music school and uh without you know no one asked him and he for 12 years he kind of suffered you know like oh, i mean he's a so he plays uh, piano, uh, uh, the, um, um, double bass, uh, guitar, accordion, and I forget which, what is the fifth instrument. Nah. So, but like, the very first thing he did after after school was over. He like he um, he you know over there like uh, military is uh, like it's you're conscripted into the military for two years. Mm -hmm. so he, after the military, he just like basically ran away from home. Didn't play any music for a while, and then he played music. Um, for six months on this like cruise liner that that cruise that that uh, sailed all around the Black Sea, and uh, he played. He told me what he played. He played keyboards, and then he um, like there was. This is like back in the I guess sixties, maybe early seventies. Mm -hmm. So they didn't have um, electric bass as widely available. So he Frankenstein some kind of a guitar, and he put these like thick strings on it, and he's like, he's like I can only put three strings, and he tuned it like somehow like. He was, he was explaining to me at the time that he explained it to me, I was like, it didn't make sense, but I guess it makes sense now. Like, <laughs> like, you know, so he played that kind of Frankenstein contraption, you know, like, um, and he had to teach himself how to play, you know, electric bass because like there was, you know, there was, there was none available, you know, so, <laughs> but uh, so he did it for six months and then he, he went to like graduate school to do something completely unrelated to music. And that ship, unfortunately, uh, it burned up in the middle of the Black Sea. It's one of the worst maritime disasters in the history of the world. Oh, Everyone on board died. So, uh, so he got out just in time, you know. And he, and after that, his relationship with music was sour because, you know, he was forced into it. You know, he was like his parents forced him to like take classical music and all that stuff. So he was very much like, if I'm gonna play anything, it's gonna be the Beatles. You know, it's gonna be stuff that I want to play. But then he mm. kind of gave it up for a long time, you know. So, um, <laughs> so, and then just very recently he like rediscovered his passion for it, and now he plays like he just plays. He got like a little keyboard, and he just plays along with his favorite like tunes. But for me, um, I didn't want to do any of that. I was like, I'm gonna like Nirvana seems like like let me see if I can play Nirvana, you know. So I, I got like a little acoustic guitar when I was 15, going on 16. And I went to a guitar class. I took a guitar class in high school, in FDR high school. And um, 
compared to your guys' program and James Madison, I remember being blown away by your, by your guys' concert, you know, compared to our concert, your music program was leaps and bounds, you know, above uh, where I went to school. Yeah. But, but still, people took it, you know, like, people would encourage me and, you know, like my music teachers. And uh, so, so I learned how to play, like, about a girl, which is the, that was the first song I learned how to play, like uh, by Nirvana, you know, just mm-hmm. like, the, cor- the the verse is like E minor to a G, so very simple. You just yeah, need to- <laughs> that's a great place to start. <laughs> exactly, and it sounds like a like a song. It doesn't sound like a you know like exercise you do- or something. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So and from there, I just like you know when you're young, like everybody like says they want to be in a band, but everyone like no one. No one wants to play bass, right? So like everyone just plays wants to play guitar and be like the, the guitar hero. <laughs> so I was kind of like, oh, I, I got interested in bass just from uh, like from from Nirvana because in Nirvana, because it's a very simple setup, like a power trio. So because mm-hmm. of dynamics, there are like in lithium, for example, right? It's like a very definite bass line, you know, doom, do doom, do doom, and I'm like. That sounds cool, you know. Like it sounds <laughs> easy. I could probably do that, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Or like, come as you are to do, 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 do. So, um, like, I could do that. So, I got like a. What was that store called? Um, Sam Mash. Remember Sam Mash? <laughs> I don't know. Of course. So, Very yeah. well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's been a while. So, uh, mm-hmm. so I got like a. In the city, it was like on 49th and maybe Broadway, mm-hmm. somewhere over there, Midtown. Yeah. Mm-hmm. This was back when Midtown was really scuzzy, and there was a lot of like. <laughs> yeah right right um so i got a, a base tab book of like nirvana and then i'm like like the the, the best of you know and i'm like oh, okay like i kind of made my way through that and then got a, a base tab book of like u2 and, and kind of made my way through that and i got a base tab book of like metallica and i'm like no nah, this is like <laughs> <laughs> this is where it stopped being fun you know and oh, just, yeah. <laughs> i could play some of it but but a lot of it like was um uh at that point like not within my uh grasp <laughs> but at that point i got into like uh, you know just playing and then like, this is like 97 going 98 and then so i met you like maybe two years after picking up a guitar picking up a bass you know mm-hmm. at, the, at that time right and the rest so, is history <laughs> and the rest is history <laughs> so so you would say so if you picked up the guitar 96 you said about? yeah like 96 97 or so yeah yeah, and so then, then bass, like maybe six months after that, you know. Mm-hmm. Okay, so then we met 98, 90, 98, 99, 98. Yeah, times, right? no, yeah, probably 98. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because yeah. if you saw, if you saw me in Madison, I graduated in 98, unless I came back for a guest appearance or something. I don't know, but I'm, I, you know, I'm not sure. I, I, I think it was in the, I don't remember if it was a fall or spring concert, but like. Mm-hmm. But, but I remember you came out and you were playing uh, Jesus Christ Superstar and you had this like white or like yellow Explorer guitar you were playing. Yeah, <laughs> like, the the Hatfield style. Yeah, yeah, and your hair was lower to place. I'm like, wow, that guy's a rock star. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I, I don't actually remember which event that was clearly, yeah. but um, uh, I, I mean, I know we discussed it and I yeah, appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, I really love hearing um, history from from my friends because uh you you know everyone remembers something different right of course yeah and then you and you piece it together you know what i mean yeah 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 when i reached out to you uh via email and said can you tell me a little bit about what you remember of the september 11th gig that we did in new jersey college of new jersey uh you told me a lot of stuff that i i (laughs) remembered when you'd said it and then you added yeah. a bunch of other other great details from other uh bits of our yeah you know our um merged timeline and um yeah yeah that's great like i had it in the wrong year i would have guessed that it was 2003 but you said 2002 clearly and then yeah. later i got an email these old emails from jason and i i found in 2002 the invite and everything and it was it's really cool so the, because of friends i was able to yeah um put the timeline together and as i'm writing it it's like in in time you know more you know like is time is time real i, I don't really believe time is real but yeah. we kind of we all kind of know how to work with it and it's it's kind of yeah. fun right so um, it's a very chronological book i'm writing and as i put things together from each year and i see how the progression of my yeah. life and i i just say this because each and every one of us can do that. And we, and we look at how far we've grown from 
a baby childhood or even yeah. our, our teen years. It's just, it's fascinating. What, what came first to enable that next step? Like if, if you didn't listen to that Nirvana thing and, and get into yeah. it, you wouldn't have checked out Metallica maybe, you know? Yeah. And, and then if you probably wouldn't have been interested enough to go check out that concert in Madison, you know, or if yeah. you did, you wouldn't have known if they said, oh, I'm interested to talk to the guitar player. It wouldn't have mattered to you, maybe, you know? Yeah. So. Yeah, I, 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 I think, yeah, like you touched on a couple of things there, like, you know, time, what does time really mean? And how do we, how do we measure time, you know? Um, and then the other thing is like, you know, being interested in music enough to, um, to participate in it, you know, and to reach out to like-minded people and to make it real and make it your own, you know? So I think, you know, as far as time, I used to, you know, for a long time, and maybe I still do to a degree, you know, measure time, not in terms of, I mean, obviously we have, everybody has to work, go to school, whatever the case may be. So you have to go by this, comply by this Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, right? The <laughs> weekend. But as of this, you know, this past year when everything is locked down, like how is a Saturday different from a Tuesday for a lot of people? You know, so really put into perspective, like how we divide a week, you know what I mean? Based yeah. on this, like, you know, a very stern, like, no, a work week is Monday to Friday, like nine to five, you know, like Randy Newman at his piano, like this, this, is, what, this is what I'm doing. And it's logical and it makes sense, but is it really real? Like, like mm -hmm. for me, not to be self-aggrandizing, but for the last 16 years, right? So I work in an ICU, I work primarily night shifts, right? So it's, so to me, I don't, I work three to four 13 hour shifts a week. And I work holidays and I work nights and, you know, I missed a lot of holidays. I missed a lot of, uh, a lot of things, uh, you know, uh, and, but the work still has to be done. And if I'm there, like if someone's sick on a Saturday night or on a Tuesday morning, like uh, they don't care that it's not the nine to five, like <laughs> suit and tie, like show up mm -hmm. to work time, they're sick and they need help. Right. So, and, and someone you know and i'm i'm there to hopefully help them right so so is my time not real am i like you know what i mean do i exist in the, like do i exist outside of a normal time like am i am i not normal just bringing it back on myself so you know i think there is something to it the time is um i, I think we really have to let, let go of like you know what you know there are certain people that are important to us and there are certain events and things that are important to us but in the larger scheme of things I think it's time is very precious and you should divide it how you see fit you know what I mean and you should mm -hmm. make the most of it you only have but so much time you know in this plane yeah. maybe there's another go around depending on people's belief system and maybe there's <laughs> not but to very strictly go by this thing like oh I have to like hustle very hard Monday or Friday so on Saturday I can like <laughs> watch the game and have a beer and everything like that's great right but at the same time at some point you have to be like well why am i why am i, I hustling so hard <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah, yeah why exactly. am i hustling so hard yeah uh, just to just for this time to have the yeah. beer you know or whatever yeah. yeah and 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 for a lot of people i mean it's 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 you have to do it like the world wouldn't work if most people didn't work nine to five right and then take off for the weekend but I just wonder when that first started, you know what I mean? It's yeah. like- uh, Couldn't have always it, been that way, right? Yeah, we could take it for granted, but but it's the same thing as like, people take for granted that a wedding dress is white, right? But that's mm -hmm. like, that's like uniquely kind of European American thing. And it's only been around for maybe 200 years, you know? The concept of an engagement ring, right? That's only been around since like 1930s. But we, but now it's like so ingrained, right? That it's like, no, of course mm -hmm. you get an engagement ring. Of course the, the wedding <laughs> dress is white. Of course you work Monday through Friday and you have the, <laughs> the weekend off, you know, <laughs> like, <All right. laughs> so, it, it, you know, it's just really not to go too far down the conspiracy kind of like uh, thing, but like, no, but very interesting, you know, like why the, the like engagement ring, it's, it's, it was introduced in, in like, I think 1937, you know, and, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Oh man, I'm, I'm right there with you. Uh, yeah. My, my sense of time and, you know, um, you know, I lost my my father when he was he was 36, right? Yeah. My father died. Yeah. So for me, I grew up with this sense that, you know, uh, just that people die. So yeah. I, I never really 
and I, and I was fortunate. I was, I had uh, good circumstances. Yeah. So somehow I never got sort of railroaded into yeah. a nine to five job that I didn't like. Yeah. I, I always had, I felt I always had choices. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, of course I did spend enough time in my life doing a job that I isn't the number one thing I want to be doing. Right. In order yeah. to, to make ends meet and stuff. Yeah. And, uh, but I, but now I'm 40, right. Yeah. And you're right behind me. I'm, I'm turning 40 <laughs> in, in two months. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I've already outlived my dad by, yeah. uh, four years and, yeah. and some friend if some friends, right. And, and, it's just so it brings this time thing and like you know if i spend any more time fortunately 2020 the the lockdown i yeah. was having some health issues and then i was kind of forced to work a lot less which was yeah. very welcome for me at the time yeah. and to stay home because I, I just needed that recharge yeah. and then since my life has become slower and uh whatever there are financial concerns of course but um yeah but you know like, you know, just knowing that I don't have forever. And so that's why I'm spending my time writing a book now Yeah, and reaching out to people doing stuff like this. This is purely, you know, a heart based um, activity, Yeah, but I, but it's meaningful, right? So why not do meaningful things? If, if our time is, is limited, as you said, we don't have, you know, we we might not get another chance depending on your belief system, you know, I think I will, but it, but it won't be as John Henry Sheridan. I, I'm, I'm quite sure, you know? Yeah. So I want to make this John Henry Sheridan time, uh, what I want it to be. And in, you know, being cognizant that I want to contribute value. I don't want to hurt people. Yeah. But I also definitely don't want to hurt myself or deprive myself. Yeah. So the more I can honor, love my heart and, and, you know, really unconditionally accept who I am and who I want to be, yeah. I could also spread that unconditional acceptance to others yeah you know and hopefully inspire more people to just really be themselves i i think i think that there, there's, there's a great truth to that you know and i think it, it goes back you know to like socrates right he said an unexamined life is not worth living so some people take it to an extreme where they like overanalyze like every single interaction they ever had and, and everything <laughs> but but some people go the opposite extreme and they just like so much like carpe diem just living in the day just enjoy, being carefree enjoying not thinking about things i think both both are extremes and both not healthy but but speaking of that gray area between the healthy stuff you know the gray matter the stuff that matters right <laughs> i think you're really onto something i think it's important like if we do have a limited time in this plane in this existence then i think it's important you know to try to understand why we're here like what we're here to do, what what mistakes we made along the way, like what 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 we can do better going forward, and also you know to model for our children, like the what what to do, what not to do, you know. And but the only way to do that is to realize what it, but why is it? What am I doing? And what am I not doing? You know what I mean? It's like yeah. how did I get here? And how am I going to move forward? And at the same time, you know you know our kids look up to us or people that when i say kids not necessarily the the people we like gave birth to but like our families right are people who look to us as you know role models or sources of strength or something like that so sphere a sphere of influence sphere of influence exactly so we want to try to model for them you know not to put a a front like a, a something fake that you're not but to try to reach within yourself, find that ideal, like find what it is that you want to be and act that way and project that, you know, and give people, you know, um, not do this rock star thing, like live fast, that young and leave a good looking <laughs> corpse, but like, no, but live, li- live in the moment and enjoy, enjoy life, enjoy the simple pleasures in life, not the material things, but the, but the simple pleasures, the breath of fresh air without mm-hmm. coughing right the, like the walk outside <laughs> right being able to do activities of daily living by yourself spending time with your family right like doing doing those things living in the moment um dying when it's your time which you have not a lot of control over right 
but instead of worrying, yeah. exactly but mm -hmm. instead of worrying about leaving a good looking corpse really like <laughs> um investing in your body you know and in your own health part of it being physical health right doing the right things by you you know we all get older right so it's and there's more maintenance more upkeep but also your emotional health mental health like spiritual health i think it's and if we invest in ourselves and i think it's an investment in your in your family and also overall in the future of mankind i think if more people take the time you know in that nine to five if they can scrounge out an hour a week to meditate to reflect you know mm -hmm. i think the world would be maybe an inch closer to being a better place or reaching its full potential you know mm -hmm. oh yeah absolutely man totally reach it reach it con now, uh, my Linda Sheridan um, yes. chimed in and said, uh, Hi, Linda. Teach, teach by example. Yes. She, that was her comment. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. T -t -t teach by example. Yeah. It's, um, you know, there's a, in a, I don't consider myself a, a Taoist, you know, but I have read Tao Te Ching. And in it, you know, one of the things it says, you know, Tao teaches us that um, of a good leader, people will say, look, we've done this ourselves. Mm -hmm. So, you know inspiring people or doing the right thing if you do the right thing people will feel empowered and they will do the right thing you know and mm -hmm. i think it's yeah teach by example like you know it's it's and and you know for a lot of people in their workplace like it's if the manager is bad and no one's no one wants to perform right they say like the, there's a west indian expression the, the fish rots from the head down right so like so if you have a bad like toxic kind of workplace toxic culture people are not going to want to do anything so if it's a band, right, and someone's like just being like, instead of being like a benevolent kind of leader, someone's just like, oh, do it, do it this way. No, you suck. You know, like mm -hmm. people are not gonna, you know, comply to comply yeah, too long. Mean, no, exactly. Yeah, like they may comply. Like if you take like Metallica as an example, right? So Jason used that. He put up with that for a long time, and then, and then he was like, no, I, I don't need this anymore. You know, why, why would I want to? You know, it's, mm -hmm. there's not enough money in the world you know he left behind millions if not billions of dollars but he's like well i just i'm just happier not being you know in this toxic kind of kind of uh, place yeah, so right yeah you know, power to him for that absolutely absolutely so yeah so i think it's yeah uh, yeah teach by example and try to embody what it is that you know that whatever your belief system is you know like believe something that that's higher than yourself Mm -hmm. and try to reach for that and hopefully reaching for that you'll become a little bit more of a reaching a little bit closer to reaching your full potential become a little bit better as a human being and hopefully inspire others or help others um to get there as well you know and mm -hmm. i think that's our human responsibility to like lift each other up you know like i'm no mm -hmm. better than, than anybody and at the same time i don't think a lot of people are better than me you know what i mean that's why I like for nobody yeah, I think there's 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 a higher power, and then there's everybody here, you know, and mm -hmm. and I think we should, you know, we're not trying to become the higher power, but we're trying to reach for an ideal, and even if we never reach it, it's better to to try, and 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 rise a little bit together as as a humankind, you know, than to not, than to just toil in this existence or. Mm -hmm. try to climb over each other you know like and right there's a saying i i don't i know i've read it i encountered it yeah. in a buddhist text but uh yeah. it might be from gandhi i don't remember but yeah. this saying is like uh it's better to take a rather than 100 steps forward by one person it's better to take a half step forward together you know yes and uh that's it's the way once i've kind of like started absorbing all these teachings that that's kind of how i live and you know sometimes i really feel like a snail with the way my dreams or visions of reality how slowly they come to fruition but yeah but they do yeah and uh it takes time it takes patience it's not glorious um and dramatic usually <laughs> yeah but that's not how i want to live you know I, i'm i'm very uh uh i'm a person who likes balance and um yeah. stability and and like continued slow but steady growth yeah you know like like nature itself you know in, in springtime and you don't have to convince the flat or the flowers or the trees that it's time to the leaves yeah. to turn green yeah but they bided their time they weren't in a rush and so like, yeah. okay now's the time 
So a lot of it's like patience, take your time to, and then, okay, time's ready. Okay, let's go, go, come on, let's yeah. go, all right? Time to act, it's not like to rush, maybe like very occasionally in life there's a reason to rush if you cross of course. the street and the car's coming but yeah you know but basically yeah just by being yourself just like a tree is itself and it flowers itself we are like yeah. that you know we'll, we'll be fine right yeah. and then we allow other people space to be themselves instead of trying to be something we're not creating an illusion that to other people that hey oh this person's like that i should try to be like that because it look like they're getting ahead of me yeah it causes this, this the rat race to, to and this like uh better uh, keeping up with the joneses you know, exactly like we we we, we in, incite it yeah you know when we when we try to show off or we, or we try to be who we're not you know exactly. it's an easy trap to fall into absolutely and and i think honestly like a lot of this like this pop pop culture kind of kind of thing and a lot of it you know it espouses these ideals you know these false ideals of like that love means like physical like hypersexualized kind of thing, like 24 7 kind of thing all the time and also that the meaning of life you know is to be successful you know what i mean mm-hmm. like right. which is like a perversion of what i believe to be the american dream american dream is like you know our our, our parents our grandparents right like I'm first generation, you're second, third generation, right? Uh, mm-hmm. You know, fourth, fifth, it doesn't matter how many generations, but our ancestors came here because this is one of the few places on earth that gave you a chance to really blossom when it was your time, you know? Mm-hmm. And blossom doesn't mean become a multimillionaire, but it just means that you you have options, you have choices, and you can make a, a life, a, a life that still may be challenging, but a life where you're a citizen of, of a country and it means something your life means something your life is worth something you know you can put something into it and get something out of it and mm-hmm. one of the few places on earth that lets you come as an immigrant and slowly work your way and and make your way in this world you know if you're many other places on earth you're consigned to you know oblivion you're you're born like in an untouchable like cast and you're never moving from there your kids not moving from there you know in a lot of places like where I'm from, for example, yeah, like it's socialized healthcare, socialized education, like it's it's free, but no one takes care of their elders. There's no such thing as a hospice. In a hospital, no one's gonna take care of you after a certain age. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So for kids, there's no special education for kids. You know what? I mean? It's just like survival of the fittest kind of thing. You know? So there's no Ukrainian dream. There's no, right? there's an American dream. Right? <laughs> Not the shit where I was born, but there's a reason that I'm here, right? And I love this country. And um, so I think but this idea of the American dream, it's been like taken to a very dangerous extreme. I think this Western idea of I'm an individual and my voice matters. And I'm, you know, where people let their feelings and their opinions, um, conv- they convince themselves that they're like so important that they don't want to listen to anybody else. And, uh, and they strive for, you know, in, in, instead of striving for, to educate themselves, right. To, to make, you know, to find vocation that's like meaningful and contributing in in, in some way to humankind. They seek to be like superstar athletes or like, or pop stars, you know what I mean? It's like, Mm -hmm. or the latest thing, like YouTuber, I'm gonna be a YouTuber, I'm gonna put out content, you know what I mean? Or just play play video games all the time. Exactly, no, 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 it's it's like like with my son, right? He's obsessed with these guys playing Minecraft, playing a video game on, you know, like watching Mm -hmm. somebody else playing a video game. And I'm like, (laughs) to me, that's mind blowing. And it's, and it's, so you have this one extreme and then you have the extreme that you have, you know, and in a, in a place like, you know, the People's Republic of China, right, where an individual doesn't matter at all, you know, or former Soviet Union, where you're part of a collective, you're part of the hive, you know, and mm-hmm. you're useful only insofar as what you can tr- contribute to the greater, uh, the, the greater, uh, you know, society, but as an individual, you don't matter. And, and it, it starts very early age, like you don't, you say your family name, like, first, right, in a lot of places, right? Like mm-hmm. you as an individual, you, you're less relevant than what lineage you come from. You know what I mean? And like we're, and that's very dangerous. Also, it's, it's it gives pe- it strips people of hope. It strips people of ind- individuality. It strips them of, you know, there's no way forward. You know, there's you're only moving 
in a designated kind of line. So there's this yeah. extreme, and then you have this hypersexualized superstar athlete kind of extreme where, you know what I mean, where people play video games online. You know, it's one thing if you're if you're a teacher, if you're a musician, and you put in your music, your music out there and it touches people like. That's mm -hmm. awesome. You know what I mean? That that's what YouTube is for. You know what I mean? <laughs> that's what right. like we were saying with this connecting the, the you know, like using technology to connect with people from 20 years ago from around the globe and putting together a piece of music. Like that's wonderful. You know, that to me in, in a small way, but in a very meaningful way, it brings people together and it gives people hope and makes them reminisce and think about it and brings them joy, you know. Mm -hmm. Um and that's awesome. That's what it should be about, you know. That's the dream, and it can be made a reality. Yeah, yeah, man. Uh, yeah, the, I, I've been reading um, Thomas Merton and this, uh, looking into his life recently. Are you familiar with him? You've heard of him? No, no, no. So Thomas Merton is a uh, very, very celebrated um, Catholic writer. Yeah, and he's a Trappist monk. Yeah. In, uh, he, his 1915, he died 1968. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm reading his biography, not autobiography, his biography, yeah. Yeah. which is this guy explains that Thomas Merton is a symbol of the century. Yeah, that's, that's a pretty big thing. Some bold statements. I'm like, I always read him because he was on my father's shelf. So throughout the years, yeah. I would pick up his book, but, and I, I always liked it, but usually it's philosophy. You know, you don't have yeah. to really read from beginning to end. But I never really delved too deep into his work but I kind of knew that I wanted to. Anyway, now's the time. And in his biography, I'm learning this guy was born in France, had to flee because 1915, had to flee yeah. within a year to the, was it the United States? He left the country yeah. um, because of World War I was going on. Yeah. And uh, then his mother died when he was five. Wow. Six, and she was a pacifist. And yeah. his father wasn't really. And, and so then his father dies at the age of 16 or 10 years later, something like that. Yeah. And now he's alone. And his brother went to, was older, went to war and mm -hmm. died in the war. Yeah. So now it's just him on his own as yeah. a teenager. And I don't know if his uncle or someone takes care of him. And then eventually he's basically on his own. And uh, he gets a girl pregnant and gets kicked out of the country basically for, yeah. for that and then he's like an exile and he ends up in columbia university in new york yeah and he um then he graduates he starts teaching and he's having like this all this existential crisis like sure, you know, yeah. what's the meaning you know then he had yeah. this he had this beautiful moment at some point he's in rome in a catholic church and he's like i want to be a catholic you know and yeah. and he had this like inkling that he wants to uh to be a, a, a monk, he wants to be a contemplative. He wants to be away from people. Yeah. He thinks he's going to be too pessimistic if he lives amongst the people, you know? Yeah. And that, anyway, that was his journey. And he, he ends up joining a Trappist monastery in uh, Kentucky, I think it was. Wow. And he lives there for like 27 years, writes many books, a lot, comes in against bumps of authority because that's really rare that a monk is allowed to be a published author with a career. Yeah. But somehow it just kind of benefited the monastery, benefited him. And uh, so he, he's, he's one of these guys responsible for really bridging the gap between Catholic Catholicism and Buddhism yeah. or, or even Taoism. He, he was like, he's like, the only way we're really going to have peace is if we start opening the door to discussing with the East and learning from them. Yeah. Because he was seeing that the West at that time, he's talking, I'm talking about 40s, 50s, 60s, yeah. he was right? He yeah. was like, we're not going to grow anymore. Like he was really yeah. sick with certain, you know, he was in love with the church, like a mother, yeah. but he was also sick when he saw that they would like condone vi violent wars. Yeah. That they would be against abortion. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, but he would stand up against it in his writings which is very bold yeah you know so he, he was a fascinating guy and he, he speaks about violence versus non but he was he was definitely a believer in non-violence yeah but he also saw how tricky it was that so he like kind of made a distinction well we kind of clearly know what well maybe it's not so clear certain violent behaviors are clear where you actually like use a gun or you hit people 
Yeah. But there's like these subtle violent behaviors. Like if you're in this institution that benefits from violent, uh, other violent institutions and you don't yeah. speak out against it, that's violence yeah. too, you know? Yeah. Funny of that, right? Yeah. Uh, and then he speaks, there's a lot of nonviolence where it's strictly in word only. Yeah. Because they are secretly benefiting from the funding or whatever it is of yeah. the violent institutions. So they claim to be nonviolent, they speak it but it's yeah. really just rhetoric. So he says true nonviolence is there's no winners. And, uh, or you could say they're all, everyone's a winner, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like this, this merging <clears throat> true nonviolence is seeing that the other, not wanting to degrade the other, not even wanting to embarrass the other, wanting the other's benefit and realizing that if the other person benefits or, or like comes around, you know, yeah. it's, it's not even, my doing right it's yeah. taking no credit because that, that that destroys it just to truly want the best for the other person yeah as well as the best for yourself of course or, or your your yeah. side of the battle yeah. whatever it is and it, it's it's deep as to what nonviolence is and i think we're closer to being able to achieve it nowadays because of technology and how fast we can yeah. learn and get move move things around he said at that time yeah. it, it was he said he, he detected the world wasn't ready for this in, a, in yeah. some level in the 50s 60s there was still a lot of growing we need to do i guess in yeah. the human race but yeah and we still do you know it's, yeah uh, we still have it we still need yeah. that yeah but but the, i think i think that's very deep and it's very meaningful it's very profound that like yeah it's not about winning you know what i mean it's like this whole thing about winning and losing like you know it's um i I wish if I were sports, right? And then like, and I want my team to win, but it's like, but my joy in my team winning is kind of rooted in someone else's misery. You know what I mean? And then yeah. like, mm -hmm. and what I found, and I trying to get away from it, I still very much enjoy sports. Is that sometimes I, uh, I'm rooting for the other team to lose more than I am rooting for my my team to win. You know, so it's <laughs> kind of like Schadenfreude, right? Like taking joy in the misery of others. And it's, it's not a, it's not a healthy thing. You know, it's like, it, it gives you like some kind of dop dopamine boost, I guess, you know, cause a lot of people do watch sports that way. But, but to me, it's like, you know, as I grow old and I realize I'm like, well, that's not like just the whole concept of winning, you know what I mean? It's, it's, <laughs> it's rooted in someone losing your, you know, if you were looking to rise above other people, you know, at their expense, like, um, you know, as you said, the better that everybody take half a step forward than one person take, a hundred steps, you know, mm -hmm. and and then the other thing you mentioned is uh, it's very deep also that yeah, you know, just because you're not participating in in violence doesn't mean you're you're nonviolent. You know, if you're benefiting from an institution that's violent, you know, then you are you are part of the problem. You know, if you're not speaking out against the injustice, you know, that that's happening, then you're, you know, it's an overused phrase, but you know, if in times of injustice you're silent and you're on the side of the oppressor, you know, it's like, right? Mm -hmm. It's like if there was no like Martin Luther, right, or 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 John Calvin, right, or or you know, or all these revolutions within the church, right, then we wouldn't, you know, then priests would be still selling indulgences. You know, you could get away with with murder, you know, just buy your way out of it. But you know, mm -hmm. somebody it took somebody with a hammer and a nail, you know, <laughs> and mm -hmm. nail the stuff to like nonviolent, but but aggressive enough that it sends a message that like no, this is we've as an institution we've gotten away from espousing the ideals of 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 a higher power you know and trying to make this world a better place and we've gotten to this all the way to this gilded kind of like you know going through the motions but not really believing in it as what we're preaching you know so and i think what he said you know also like just just because in, like non just because not violent doesn't mean you're nonviolent. It's the same thing that, you know, this, this idea of, uh, not to get too political, but I'm reading this book now, it's called How to Be Anti-Racist by Ibram X. Candy. And in it, he just lays it out. It's like, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, I'm not racist, you know, I'm not political or whatever. But like, but if you're choosing to not, to, to not acknowledge that there is a problem, you know what I mean? It, it, doesn't, it doesn't make you a good person, you know? Like you're, you're actually, believe it or not, you, not you, John Henry Sheridan, but somebody who is like, Oh, it doesn't concern me, so it must not be a thing. Then you're contributing to, you're giving voice to 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 people. You know, you're letting, you know, the racists or the you know the violent people have their say, 
and I'm not saying that means we have to go outside and and and, and you know raise a flag or anything, but you can vote with your wallet. You know, like I'm very I'm very pro-choice, right? So every month I donate to Planned Parenthood. You know what I mean? I don't advertise it. It's not, I don't, you know, you know what I mean? It's not like on my uh, social media. I just do it because that's my way of like my nonviolent resistance to this, like, you know, mm -hmm. state sponsored thing of the state telling people what they can do with their bodies. You know what I mean? So, yeah. you know, it's a little thing, but hopefully it does matter, right? And so far mm -hmm. as like, you know, if I don't do anything, if it doesn't concern me, it doesn't mean that I should not do anything about it because as you said, right, our time is very limited on this earth, right? And if we can do something about it, by golly, we should, you know? <laughs> and it doesn't mean we have to go and like and, and break stuff, you know? Right. But if you if you believe in, in the political process, then that means voting in the local election, you know what I mean? Or petitioning your, your, your local people, like uh, representatives, you know? It may mean fundraising, you know what I mean? It may be raising awareness. And it may start with you, like realizing yourself what's important, why am I here? And uplifting your fellow, your fellow man, you know? But if we mm -hmm. don't do any of that, then as you said, we've chosen, or you know, we've chosen side of violence, you know, by not participating in it, you know, like by by not acknowledging that there is violence. Mm -hmm. You know, it's I I think, you know, I yeah, think being it, a, a silent yeah. uh um enabler type of thing exactly yeah you know? that reminds me so like yeah the one thing i i donate to and, and something i don't particularly advertise is uh yeah. not not the aspca i, I have uh, so i'm definitely definitely not a fan of animal cruelty i, yeah. I hope no one is but yeah. um, it's definitely a sore spot for me yeah but and that part of part of what fuels my veganism yeah uh, but um so I, I do donate to one place called Farm Sanctuary that rescues yeah. animals. So it's it's more yeah. of a uh, a positive thing. There are some that are just like how to get the animal abusers. Like that's like, which is a bit of a dark energy. I'm not saying that's wrong. If if, if that's what how yeah. justice has to evolve in this society, that's yeah, yeah. great. Yeah. But uh, that's not really what I want to fuel. But yeah. the, a place that's safe, taking care of, is rescuing animals and taking care of them. And uh, and I. I in that particular case, I don't feel like I've donated much, but I do feel that that's a cause that if the yeah. guy, the guy who someone gets in the office and sees my my small amount, says, "Okay, yeah. good, another donation." It's different than if I didn't send it at all, right? Absolutely, absolutely. You know? yeah. Or different yeah. if I use that money to, to throw away, you know, or whatever. Absolutely, absolutely. No, it makes I think like every little bit like it makes uh, um, it makes a difference. It, it moves. It moves the needle like a little bit over towards the side of mm -hmm. towards the side of goodness, you know what I mean? And and if if we don't do anything at all, then it's it's not that the needle is gonna stay in the neutral. It's gonna move towards more of the side. More mm -hmm. animals will be will be abused. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? Or like yeah. or mm -hmm. more people will have their choices taken away. You know? And I totally hear what you're saying about not contributing to like you know like going after the abusers because it's like an eye for an eye, right? What like what is that? You know, yeah. it's like whereas your, you know, this organization it, it actually helping the animals. Like that's the bottom line, right? It's like to. <laughs> no, yeah. I, I I think that's really awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. And uh, something else that you uh, when you were talking reminded me. Um, <clears throat> so there's this YouTuber that I think is super influential. I really yeah. appreciate him. His name is Infinite Waters. Mm -hmm. His yes. name is Ralph Smart, but Infinite yeah. Waters is his uh, channel. Yeah. Um, have you ever heard him before? I, 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 I've, I've, I've heard the name and I've heard someone, someone mention it. So um, one cool thing he says, he, this guy, I mean, he puts out pretty much a video every day for I don't know how yeah. many years. So he's had over 3,000 videos up there yeah. that are inspirational. Yeah. It, it's just amazing that he is so consistent, you know? Yeah. And his message always uplifts me. It's not always what I need to hear, but a lot of times it is. Anyway, so one thing he says is... Uh, the revolution will not be televised. Yeah. You know, it, the revolution will be internalized. So wow. like you were saying about, yeah. you know, how you feel you can make a difference by yeah. donating to this cause. It doesn't have to be this. We don't, and then you don't advertise, you know, we don't have to like say, look, I'm putting money in the pot, you know, or look, yeah. I'm, I'm sending the, 
mad email at this this figure who's I don't agree with. Yeah. You know, it's uh, the the real revolution. Whatever we see on TV is a big or in any media yeah. is a, is a show, right? On some level. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's what's happening in in our heart that ultimately matters. Yeah. You know, and, and we've seen historically French Revolution, any revolution where violence is used to tip the scales to the other yeah. side, then that new side then becomes the perpetrator of, of violence. And Ab absolutely, absolutely. That, uh, that's why, like, yeah, I mean, at certain certain points, a change does have to be made, you know what I mean? But But we have to be very realistic about that. If it's a change that's the price of it is bloodshed of and and whenever it's bloodshed it's not going to be just the bad people who who get hurt mm -hmm. it's going to be a lot more innocent people who get hurt so we like we can make peace with it you know but we we can't be we can't not acknowledge it and and we we can't say that it's okay the good outweigh the bad like no it's it's bad you know it's <laughs> it's it's very very bad and 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 some things there are just there are not several lines to it you know and I, I was speaking with somebody about you know for a long time my philosophy in life was like to not deal with things like compartmentalize them just file them away and not deal with them right and uh or like look for the silver lining like in every like oh everything happens for a reason like this bad thing happened but it taught me this and this and that and it got me through some very tough times you know and but as I grow older, I realize what would help from people is that like, that's not, that's not, that's not the best thing, you know, like some things are bad and we have to acknowledge that they're bad in real time and deal mm -hmm. with them, you know, and everything mm -hmm. happens for a reason, but may not be a good reason, you know, mm -hmm. and we learn from it true, but we still have to acknowledge that this thing is bad and it makes you feel bad and running away from it and trying to find, put a positive spin on it is, is it's a defense mechanism right it's a coping mechanism but it's but it, it's it's not always going to work and it's not always the, the right thing so if it's so if a revolution is requires bloodshed which is almost always does then we have to be honest about it and say that it is bad and we have to remember <laughs> all the people that you know that that pay for it with their lives you know it's like it's mm -hmm. it's we have to we have to be honest with it it's it's not uh it's not mm -hmm. something that can be brushed brushed aside or we can that we can be yeah just because we're not taking up arms and the revolution doesn't mean we're not complicit in it if we don't acknowledge that that bloodshed is bad you know it's right. yeah 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 I, I you know reading um thomas merton i got yeah. some more insight and re and just talking to people and just th just being myself thinking and yeah there's there's so many on the America, United States can be criticized a, a lot. So yeah. I'm not uh, not about that because I do truly appreciate where I live and I've traveled enough to see that yeah. it is quite a special place. Yeah. And for whatever reason, it's kind of one of the more evolved countries. Uh, there are probably yeah. other countries that are much more evolved in America. I don't know. Yeah. But uh, it for publicly, you know, like the common knowledge is that America is like a place where, like you said, you could realize your dreams. And even if other countries are more evolved in some ways, the doors are not open to allow people in the yeah. same way like the US is. So, yeah. um, so I totally appreciate it. Uh, but I do recognize that freedom is not what we think it is. Freedom isn't yeah. do whatever you want. <laughs> yeah. Freedom is more like um, sort of like the privilege of not having to be oppressed kind of. Yeah, you know that that's more what the essence of freedom is that we yeah. we have uh, our own sovereignty each and every one of us, and that yeah. we have the uh, we we're like allowed to be responsible for our own lives. We're allowed yeah. to be one hundred percent responsible with a system that can support it. You know, if we if we are truly responsible. Yeah, you know. So, but it, but you know, clearly America has been very violent, right? In in its yeah. history, there's no getting around that. So I'm not against the military in like any active way. I know you could be a peaceful person in the military. It is possible, yeah. right? I know that they're practicing Buddhists that are in the military. That's what their life brought them. And they yeah. realize that they don't want to hurt people, you know, so like yeah. they have to kind of live with that. 
Um, I don't think a military is by definition evil or anything. Uh, I, I don't know what would be how we could sort of outgrow it so that it doesn't have to include guns, you know, yeah. but I'd like to see that happen. No, no bombs, yeah. you know, somehow just like this force of disciplined, united people that do the heavy lifting when, when it, it is necessary in emergencies yeah. or whatever. But uh, anyway, I guess the, the point is you could go, it's, we, we love uh, as, I don't know, maybe it's being Western Westerners. Yeah. I think partly being Westerners, we like this like dichotomy, this or that, you know, yes. black or white thing. We really yes. like it. And like America, you could jump down the rabbit hole of, of how terrible America is, or yeah. you could be super proud of why it's the best. And neither is going to be that useful, you know? Yeah. It, it's important to super pre, be very appreciative of what yeah. is truly benef, uh, beautiful about any situation. Yeah. Whatever country you're in, of course, the yeah. young people, not in America. And so, whatever country you're in to appreciate it even if it's a rough country there must be something beautiful about it yeah and at the same time if it's doing some nasty things yeah to 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 acknowledge it, at least start within yourself and see that you know there's something going on here and i'm part of it because i live here and how can i how can i not add to it you know because sometimes it's really tough to you don't know what, what what's right or wrong, you know? Yeah, I, I think you, you really hit on something there, like the dichotomy, the like it's really like a lot of people have this like very borderline way of thinking where they see the world just very much like light and dark, black and white, like, uh, like and I think it, the mature and the responsible thing to realize is that there's no, there are no absolutes in, in the world, I think, you know, or very few absolutes, I would say. So you can be very much anti-war and you can still support the military. Like, you know, I have friends who are in, the, in on armed forces. You, you probably do as well. A lot of people know somebody who either in their family or their friends are in the armed forces. And it has to exist because this is the world that we live in. So there has to be, has to be there. But at the same time, you can be very much anti-war and like, rally against it and, and be peaceful in the same way as like you know we need the world we live in there's going to be crime so there needs to be police right so but we we can also acknowledge that like yes in the society that we live in we're not l yet living in the in, in in the kind of utopia <laughs> that we hope to be where there's not crime where there's not danger so there needs to be some form of authority that it can intervene and you know, and, and have some kind of order. Yet at the same time, we could acknowledge that like, you know, there's there's been a lot of violence and abuse, right? From the side of law enforcement. And it doesn't have to be this false dichotomy of you're like with the police or you're against them. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, it's, yeah. and again, what you see on TV is very much like, it's very performative, you know, it's very like the news, right? <laughs> so like on the news, they're not going to tell you something's happy. They're not going to tell you like, you know, somebody went to, to a job and like, and just did their job and came home and, and like, it was great. Okay, <laughs> that's boring, right? Boo. Uh, <laughs> no, you want to see like a horrible car crash, hostage standoff, you know what I mean? Violent rally turns more violent, you know, like, mm -hmm. uh, you know, this, this actor that you thought was a good guy, he's like mm -hmm. not a good guy because he did a bad <laughs> thing, you know? So, and I think it's, it's the further we get, the more introspective we are, the more we find out about ourselves that, but also around the world, that there's no such thing as there's no, you can, we should be mature enough to realize that there are very few absolutes and we should strive to reach for harmony and, and, and not try to cling to these, like, the only way forward is to do this one thing. And everyone who doesn't mm -hmm. agree with me is stupid, you know, like, and they're, you know, and. <laughs> No, you have to you have to try to you know to see see things from other people's perspective. Even if you don't agree with them, but you shouldn't you should try to understand where they're coming from. And then, but because if you don't try to understand, then you're just being willfully ignorant. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And the only way forward is to try to communicate. You know, and you're not going to get along with everybody. You're not going to agree with everybody. You know, that's impossible. But if we don't even try to 
to talk to them, you know, mm-hmm. than we're doing ourselves and the world of the service. And especially now, getting back into the technology side piece, right now it's been easier than ever in the history of mankind to connect with people, you know? Mm-hmm. And a lot of people like the news, they use it for evil. They use it to sell, to sell clicks, you know what I mean? Like yeah. reaching across the globe to sell people this news story about an incoming war or like a celebrity who like, who cheated on his wife or whatever, right? But at the same time, you can do something like this, you know, where you can, you connect to people in Brazil, right? Or in Japan, right? Mm-hmm. And you connect and you, you move forward and it's a good thing, you know, it's a, mm-hmm. that's, that's what I think we should be reaching for, you know? Yeah. That, that, and that, that reminds me of kind of why I wanted to uh, do a podcast. Yeah. Um, there, there's the, self-promotional bit which is kind of like as an entrepreneur yeah if, if that's what i am yeah i don't even know but uh if i'm going to have books or music how do people know about them so i'm not into promoting yeah so one thing is you, you have a podcast and then you yeah. do kind of you perform a service and yeah. then through that people might be interested in you and, and you might have opportunities to mention what you do and so that's part of why I want to do podcasts, but I would, I, I just like podcasts. I actually, I don't listen to them now because I'm not traveling to work like I was yeah. before, but uh, I, I, I more YouTube videos, but um, yeah. uh, I really got a lot out of podcasts when I was listening to them. And yeah. I, uh, it's kind of like the similar feeling of you see a band that you really like and you're like, man, I wish I could be in a band like that. You know, yeah. like, I just want to try it too, you know? Yeah. And uh and I, but a lot of the podcasts I listen to, even though I was listening to ones that are, I very rarely I listen to people like celebrities, you know, being yeah. interviewed. Or, possibly, you know, maybe the guy from ACDC would be interviewed. That would interest me. But, you yeah. know, but generally I would be more interested in lower level sort of success stories. Or that was just what was available to me yeah. in, in like the music realm or in the entrepreneurial realm or something like that. Um, but even that, I was like, the success, the success bit was making me a little upset. Yeah. Like, yeah. why do we have to like reach up? Yeah. You know, not that you want to reach down, but it doesn't have to be any which way. You know, it's like, I just yeah. want to talk to, or, I just want to listen at that point. I just want to listen to ordinary people that have something meaningful to say that doesn't make me feel like shit because I'm not doing it. You know, yeah. so, so many podcast it's like well that's when i reached 100,000 subscribers and and like they, even though they are no name it's like they still have that you know yeah. and it's like how am i going to do that do i even want to do that you know so rather yeah. not that people can't talk about their accomplishments on this show but it's just not about it you know so it's like talking to ordinary people meaning i mean there's nothing i don't mean ordinary and extraordinary or, no, no, or like no. different I, I understand I understand you know what, what I mean? you mean. Yeah. <laughs> like, sort of man on the street, but basically yeah. the people I know, and I'm not going out of my way to like convince someone who doesn't know me that they should be on my show to lift my show. My yeah. show is just about connecting human beings that I already know, or maybe I'll, I'll meet whatever. I'm not against having people I don't know on the show, but yeah, that's not the point of it, you know? Yeah. So the point is to connect with people. And what do I talk about when I connect with friends? I talk about music that yeah. ends up in philosophy. And then it goes every which way. So, Absolutely. No, I know. think that, that, that's exactly that. That's instead of reaching up towards maybe like an unreachable kind of goal or reaching down, like I'm going to be like a pastor and I'm going to like leave my flock. It's more about reaching across, you know, reaching, mm-hmm. reaching out, you know, I'm not being tried, but like reach out and touch somebody's hand, right? Make this world a better mm-hmm. place if you can. It, it, it sounds like a silly like rhyme, you know, it sounds like somebody, somebody's just wrote down on a napkin but like but there really is something to that you know what i mean it's like you know to me i don't go to church very often and like the last couple of times that i've been in catholic church it was either for you know it was for funerals right or for a mass when but like to me one of the most powerful things is when you know when the 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 who's leading the congregation right he would say turn to your neighbor and like just shake their hand right yeah, peace be and with you mm-hmm. exactly yeah peace be with you exactly thank you <laughs> um so that's such a powerful thing you know it's like and it's a thing that's it seems when you're doing it it seems like a little like weird right and like maybe a little mm-hmm. silly right right 
Right, and, almost, yeah, almost icky people are nervous about it, right? Exactly, and it's like, why is that? You know, because like this whole thing of like, you know, even like walking down the street, like you would never think to like hold hands with your with your friend, right? Because <laughs> it's weird. Some someone might think something, you know, mm-hmm. and but it's like so weird. <laughs> why is that? Why is that so weird? Yeah, yeah. It's 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 like we've been like conditioned with Granda like that. You no, know, we. It's really important what other people think of us, you know. Like, and it's important that they don't think we're weird, you know. And the way to the way forward is to get people to like us, you know. Like, even you know, all these like influencers, like, you know, like I have a, a hundred million likes, you know what I mean? And like, and then but then you see they have like five dislikes, and then they turn off the comment section because they don't want to hear like the negative stuff, you know what I mean? So, but, but it's like, it, I agree with you. It. It's, it's more, I think more so about reaching out and touching someone's hand and like, and hearing what it is they have to say, you know, and like, and, and then I think it, it teaches you about them. Right. But also I think it teaches you about yourself also, like stuff you didn't, didn't know about yourself, didn't realize yourself or didn't remember about yourself. You know what I mean? Like I, mm-hmm. someone might tell me a story from 20 years ago and I'm like, really? <laughs> like, <did> that <laughs> happened? I said that. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. And it could be good, you know, it could be like, oh, I, that was a funny thing I did, you know, or it could be bad, you know, like, oh, shit, you know, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. But, but the point is, is like, is, um, yeah, there's something really powerful about that, about what you're doing is it's really like examining your life and, you know, moving, finding your place in it, finding, finding meaning in it. And, you know, I think a huge part of it is, uh, is, is talking to other people in your life, you know, mm-hmm. and, uh, and seeing, you know, seeing, seeing where, where, um, where that could take you, you know, I think it's, I think it's a, I think it's a cool thing. I think it's a powerful thing. And I think it's a, it's a necessary thing, you know, it's, it's very necessary. You know? Cool. Yeah. I'm glad to hear that. I appreciate the uh, support on that. Yeah, of course. You know, like, so at some point, uh, um, at some point um, when I was feeling not so good last year, yeah. uh, and I want to slow down. Uh, yeah. I it got to the point like like really like my. I was almost like a horse that was like. Putting his heels into the dirt, like I'm not going anymore, right? Yeah. Or, or donkey, like sorry, yeah. I'm not going anymore. My body was just telling me that. Yeah. And uh, the only thing I wanted to do was um, was go inward. Yeah. Is the only thing I wanted to do, and and I had this chance. The the lockdown gave me this like perfect excuse you know that yeah. i'm allowed to do it now and it's, it was the answer to my prayers really and yeah. then i started to do this the autobiography and because i always want to but i was just i want to go so deep that i never was gave yeah. myself the opportunity to and now i'm like i'm just going to go deep because it's like who cares what anyone thinks you yeah know, what, what difference does it make i don't think i'm better than anyone else yeah but i think my life is precious just like everyone else should think their life is precious. They have the opportunity yeah. to think that too. Yeah. And I want to discover, you know, I'm so much as on the hamster wheel trying to like get this next yeah. level of something, but maybe I actually accomplished my dreams, right? Who knows? Maybe I did, you know? And as I start looking into my life, I'm like, I write this story. I write this. I'm like, I did so much of the things I want to do. Like, why yeah. am I still feel so hungry? Like I didn't, succeed yeah. I'm, I'm super successful according to my own standards yeah. you know if i took the time to, to look at it yeah but you have to take that time yeah. and then when you do when i did probably when anybody does i realized oh man the, you know one what was so great about my life was was my friends or the yeah. people that i did this cornucopia album with and and yeah well this year and then i saw them like i gotta just reach out to people because that's what's meaningful, you know? So yeah. the, the autobiography, it brought me deeper into myself, which brought me to spread my hands out. Remember, remember that's who I am. Because without yeah. these connections, my identity is just, is what, you know? The, yeah. the, I am who I know. I am who I inter- interrelate with. Yeah. So while I'm still here, to let's say, say, hey guys, let's, put, let's tell our stories together. You know? Yeah, I, I think I, I think it's listen, I, I think it's it's very meaningful and very powerful. Yeah, like I, you're you've always always thought of you as like a the linchpin, like you did holds like everybody together. You know, there's like a few people that like 
it's not even six degrees of separation. You probably know, like every, probably every musician in Brooklyn, like is like two, two degrees separated from you. You know what I mean? Because you've always been this, this, uh, you know, you've always you kind of brought people together. You've people like gravitated towards you, and it's uh, be, because you know you you've you've taken the time to really to really listen to listen actively. You know, not just wait for your turn to speak, but really like get meet people where they were at you know in terms of like musical skill like uh or in terms of even if you disagree with them politically especially or you took the time to listen to them and like kind of take them in and i think because of that people people feel comfortable around you you know what i mean people and people want to uh collaborate with you you know be it musical be it whatever it may be you know you have this in, in incredible quality in you you know and uh in all the times that I've known you, you haven't changed, and I hope you know well, you know. But if you do, like, so be it. But 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 <laughs> well, what I'm saying is that's it's your journey, right? But like, I think that's there is something to it. Like you, you, I think you do have this very gift of bringing people together. You have as long as I've known you, and and I think it is something to be cherished, but also to be like kind of nourished. You know what I mean? In the same way, like you you do a certain diet, you do it for your health, right? But in the same way, like you have this way of bringing people together and making people feel good about themselves and about you. And that's also something that has to be, you know, you kind of, you have to feed that fire, you know, you have to kind of put put mm-hmm. some work towards it, you know, to, you know, to kind of like maintain those relationships and you know, to, because this life, you know, on this plane is all we have. And, and, you know, I, you mentioned before at this point, you've, outlived your dad may he rest in peace you know by four years already you know so every day that you have on this earth is another opportunity for you to do things you know that he may have never dreamed of you know what i mean and, but and mm-hmm. here you are and you're you're doing it you're taking the opportunity you're taking the time to you know to to tap into to realize who you are and what it is that you're here to do and to to try to feed that fire you know what i mean and like and so mm-hmm. i can so it can warm everybody around you. <laughs> yeah, thank you for, for those words. Yeah, yeah, really, no. really inspiring. Yeah. So let's see, we got a comment from Jason Hills here. Oh, yeah. Hey, Jason. Um, hey, Jason, if you're still there. Um, he said, not to take away from successful creators, but the population is self-selecting. You hear them because they have a lot of subscribers. And they have a lot of subscribers because they are being heard. Lots of good content and talent out there. Uh, yeah, the population is self-selecting. You hear them because they have a lot of subscribers. They have a lot of subscribers sitting here. Yeah, I, I, I think I get that. Uh, but yeah, I, all, all I know is when I, in my YouTube Fench journey, which I've been, yeah. I think I joined it on 2008 or something. Yeah. And uh, but just really to park videos there, you know, from my website. So if someone yeah. said, what do you do? I could point to them. Yeah. There wasn't no idea about subscribers at that time. Yeah. But then uh, around uh, 2014, I think I started to decide to actively build it. Then I started my get John Henry Tullison's channel too. Um, and now I have as many as I have, but uh, I built it brick by brick. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Like brick by brick, I, n- no shortcuts, no cheating. A lot of times I would go up and I would lose a few. Go, up. you know, if I get one a week, I'm happy. You know. Yeah. Sometimes I I got several a week. Sometimes I got one a month. Yeah. So, uh, for me, um, I I I'm focusing. I'm much more interested in being just sharing my creations. And yeah. I'm a content creator, but like I don't have this. My personal um, perspective is not to, uh, it's not to fulfill a need that's outside of me, yeah. you know? So if, if I believe that my need to, to create and put it out into the world is responding to some energy out there that does want it, yeah. but, but I'm not looking for what's needed that I could do and then doing that. I'm just doing what my soul asked me to do. Yeah. And then, and then working with that energy and, and it may be a lot smaller scale than, than others. And uh, that's perfectly fine. Um, I can't help but want to grow it more, but uh, I also know myself and I don't like promotions. I don't like doing a lot of stuff. I'm very picky. 
in terms of like uh, what, you know, I, I have to feel at peace at the end of the day, you know, and, you know, and, and I have, I have a, a wonderful life. So there's no need for me to over. Yeah. Be greedy in a sense, you know? Yeah. No, I, I think it's, it's important to be true to yourself and, and to really, um, like you're, you're not like if, if an opportunity arises, you you would explore that opportunity, but you're not making it your life's goal to like, to become this huge success because I, you know, like you're not cheat, you're not chasing it. You're, you're open. You're like an open kind of, uh, you know, mm -hmm. here's your fire. <laughs> Anybody mm -hmm. can, can come to it. And if a lot of people come great, you know, like may have to build a bigger, bigger fire, but you're not, you're not looking to, you know, you're, you're not like hustling, you know what I mean? And like, and the, like the YouTube channel is like, is, is your whole, like the meaning of your life, your whole life existence, you know, because mm -hmm. I think it's, it's not the kind of person that you are. You know, a lot of people, these people who talk about their success, success story, you know, a lot of it you know, sounds very depressing. They're like, you know, like I, I lived like, you know, it, I don't know, like in an apartment of 15 people and I like ate, like, I don't know, like, <laughs> <laughs> like eat blog food you know and work five jobs just so i could like have my youtube channel and even now like i i sleep two hours a day and i like i'm always hustling you know all stuff and i'm like that doesn't really sound like you're you're happy you know what i mean it, like it sounds you're, you're successful right in whatever definition of your success is meaningful to you but it doesn't like their life has become this kind of puzzle and they don't stop and they're like almost like they can't stop, almost like a shark, right? Like it can't stop swimming, you know, because if it stops, I don't know what happens to them. <laughs> right. I don't know, they get eaten by other sharks or they stop breathing, but right. whatever the case may be, they, the hustle becomes them, you know, there's, they're, they lose themselves in this pursuit of like, whatever it is, success or whatever it is that they convince themselves that is important. And it's great if like in their pursuit of success, they inspire other people, but not if they burn themselves out or no. up, you know. No, because who's going to take care of you if you burn yourself out? Absolutely, it's it's not it's not worth it. Like I, you know, I remember having a conversation with a good friend of mine, Ricky. It was, it was like, you know, like the bad thing about being a workaholic is like if you die at work, they're going to say, oh, he was a good worker." Okay, and then they're going <laughs> to post a job the very next day. You know, the very next day. So, but in your family, who's going to replace you? Like, there's mm -hmm. no no one, you know. No, and no. so that's a very important. This like whole like work-life balance right it's very you know it's drilled into us from an early age that like you know like you have to work you have to provide for your family which is absolutely true that's you know that's right it's one of the basic tenets of, of life right and at the same time it's not taught to us you know in school or anywhere like just how important the small moments are you know like taking your son for a walk right talking about nothing mm -hmm. just or watching your, you know, your favorite movie together, you know, like, or those are the moments, like, you're only going to be 40, you know, for a year, yeah. and your son's only going to be, like, a toddler, or a young boy, or a kindergartner, only for one year of his life, and those are the memories that you have, and those are the moments that really do matter, right, mm -hmm. you know, when you look back on, on this, on this 20 years from now, Lord willing, right, <laughs> like, what are you going to remember, right, it's not going to yeah. be, how many subscribers you know, like how no. many likes no. it's gonna be that like walk in the park and you know finding a really cool rock you know like or a really mm -hmm. cool stick that looks like a gun yeah. you know like, yeah and then you sword fighting over that yeah, yeah exactly because that's like because and honestly like how is that not more important or as important at least as as anything else yeah right the, you know it's amazing it's um it's really it's a blessing to see to have a family around you who loves you and and you know to have the time with them you know it's a uh, like yeah it's it's very simple <laughs> it's hard to yeah, get there it's, it's hard very to simple it. yeah, yeah i remember when i was in my 20s a teenager definitely 20s yeah i really thought maybe what's more important having a kid or having you like a hit album really like yeah. like there's that that question like yeah yeah because star stardom appeal was just so much, was just so strong at that at my yeah. young age, and I didn't understand how having a child could be so rewarding. I, I mean, I knew on a gut level it must be true because everyone said so. Yeah, yeah. But but I'm like, 
why because everyone anyone can do it right but not everyone yeah. can make a great album you know that was just yeah. my young mind yeah but but now having it having a son uh yeah those those moments like you said walking in the park which we do often yeah i mean or him just whatever fooling around at home yeah it's so precious and i just i can't even i can't even fathom what what would be like if i was on the road yeah and having to leave my family regularly yeah i mean i just i i can't i just can't imagine what the heck i, I think life would be very painful for me if, yeah. if i had to do that that's not my you know yeah leaving the nest is not what my personality if i could help it you know sure yeah of course I'm forced to no and if you look and if you look unfortunately a lot of people who were you know who are who we think to be successful musicians right if you look at peter Steele, right if you look at i don't know kirk cobain and if you look at people who you know were not happy and probably part of it was because they were they left home to join the circus and then they couldn't stop you know and if they wanted to because there was always pressure and expectations on them, or maybe it's pressure they put on themselves and then they burned up and, you know, or if you look at somebody who, you know, just using the example of like Metallica, right? So they're multimillionaires who are like, they're very fortunate they had people who like, for James Hetfield, who could like, he can afford the good rehab, you know what I mean? But he's mm -hmm. like, you know, how many people couldn't afford rehab and are, you know, are like, you know, unfortunately he rests in peace like Peter Steele, you know what I mean? Like I was thinking, I was, you know, I put music for Henry all the time to come kind of full circle. What music I was listening to when I was a kid, the music that I put on for Henry, I put on everything for him. I put on everything that I listen to. And if he likes it or doesn't like it, we kind of talk about it, you know? Mm -hmm. So, you know, for, for some reason I, I put on, we kind of went down this rabbit hole and we put on like Alice in Chains Unplugged, which is like such a, such a great album. Like the, mm -hmm. the bass tone on that is just amazing, you know? Yeah. Um, so we listened to that and we listened to a little bit of Pearl Jam, a little bit of Soundgarden, like Nirvana. And I'm like, out of the four big like grunge bands, right? Um, and Nirvana, like Soundgarden, Alice in Chains and Pearl Jam, only Pearl Jam is left, you know? And I mean, I know Alice in Chains is still going with a different singer, but I mean, like of those people who influenced me, like Kirk Cobain passed away and he was 27. Lane Staley from Alice in Chains, he was, I think 35 or so, not old, like right? That, right? And, mm -hmm. and was very sick, right? And a lot of it that, Unfortunately, he did to himself, you know, and Chris Cornell may he rest in peace also like somebody who was, I'm not saying it was because of stardom, but, but it's, but you got to wonder, like, you know, it's hard not to uh, connect yeah. those pieces. Yeah, exactly. And is it worth it? Like, you know, for, because I think when we're younger, when I was in my twenties, yeah, I wanted like, well, maybe, maybe like late teens, but early twenties, I'm like, yeah, I want to like be a rock star. Cause that's what is drilled into you, you know, from an early mm -hmm. age at like, it's it's kind of all or nothing you either a rock star or you're like a chump <laughs> chump exactly you're one of these lame people <laughs> like you know like right. and you know in the best world you can you can do both you know but i mm -hmm. think it's I, I think for every success story there are like people who are like really successful and have these careers and have like families and stuff there are also you gotta wonder how much of it is a facade as well you know what i mean like like Mick Jagger, he has a number of children, right? With a number <laughs> of women. But does he see them? Does he go for walks in the park or like, you know? Right, how'd that work? Yeah. yeah. And does he even like, how happy is he? I mean, I'm sure like there are moments of like happiness I can't even imagine because he, he can be on, I don't know, whatever rich people do. He's in a yacht with oysters and I don't know, like <laughs> whatever. But, but okay, that dopamine effect lasts for like five minutes and then he's, you know, he's alone, you know, yeah. and, 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 you know, he's, even if he's in a private jet, he's still, you know, away from home. He's a Rolling Stone, no pun intended, you know, right. And, uh, it's just kind of, he, this kind of, you know, he's, he ran away to join the circus and now he, he can't stop because if he doesn't put out some content then he immediately becomes irrelevant, you know what I mean? And, and mm -hmm. so he has to, even if he doesn't want to, he has every couple of years, he has to be like, oh, time for another tour. Like, uh, like I'm sure he doesn't want to play. Like, I can get no satisfaction for the like 8 million time. You know? <laughs> but, you know, in fact, he can get satisfaction. Right, you know? no, not if he has to keep doing that, no. Yeah, so it's like, uh, yeah, you got to wonder. And, and does he, 
is he even excited about making new music? You know, I can imagine Mick Jagger at the seven years old or whatever. And Keith Richards like, yes, let's, let's, <laughs> let's really like sit down. I've been listening to a lot of like <laughs> classical music and I can't wait to just, you know, come I've on. Listen to, to top 40, uh, 2020 yeah. uh, pop songs and everyone yeah. make a mark. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, man. Uh, when when I so he was one of my challenges. So for years, I felt compelled to write my life story, right? Yeah. And there's this you come up against this all the time if you feel that way. Yeah. Within myself, which is like, well, who am I to, yeah. to write a story? And then then other people say, well, even relatives would be like, well, who are you to to write a story? Uh -huh. Of course, it's not going to stop me, but of course, but it's not helpful maybe you know yeah. unless i'm that type of person to say well i'll prove you wrong but that's yeah. not really my type my personality so um then i realized okay part of what's uh blocking me from wanting to from writing my story is i thought i had to say the rock star dream right yeah. I, that's what i thought my story was yeah I, it was i mean for years i thought it was going in that way and i wanted to tell about my evolution as a musician and yeah then the then the success story which never came in the traditional sense. Yeah. So, which I'm very, very super happy about, honestly, you know, no, no, yeah. uh, <laughs> no sugarcoating it. Um, yeah. I can't imagine, I basically it would have been a nightmare if I succeeded, uh, I'd feel. But, um, <clears throat> uh, so I realized my story is not the rock star dream. My story is not the American dream. My story is what I found out by reading Thomas Merton's <clears throat> biography yeah uh, my story was is what would be called spiritual biography yeah so or spiritual autobiography mm -hmm. so when in that that the shape of it is rather than like hustling and then succeeding or i guess the rockstar dream and the american dream are a little bit yeah of the same yeah, yeah, yeah. rockstar dream you might get lucky american dream generally not you you yeah. just work really hard and then you yeah. succeed but uh the spiritual biography is, you know, you, you it's kind of like the Paradise Lost story or um, yeah. Inferno, Dante's Inferno. Like you go through yeah. this chasing the uh, chasing the dream or chasing these pleasures, then you descend into hell, <laughs> and somehow you come out of it, and you you realize that uh, that the best path is the middle path, or you realize that yeah. you, some sort of enlightenment aspect of it where you want to become lighter rather than heavier instead of like you know, yeah like reaching out instead of reaching up to this yes. like lofty goal or or uh, even you know focusing on the treasures of the heart rather than treasures of the storehouse you know you know the accumulation thing it's more yes about accumula accumulation. accumulation of wealth yeah yeah and and that's what my story has been and uh it's i'm not so i'm not bragging about that anyone could choose that story if that's what their life path is you know yeah. It's just a certain style of living. And, but when I found, realized that, it helped me to see, okay, my story is, uh, there is an arc. Uh, when if, if the rock star dream thing, it just kept falling flat because I never got there. Yeah. So I'm like, that, that's definitely not it. I didn't know what it was, but, but seeing this like sort of template of the spiritual autobiography, it helped, helped me to realize what my story is so I could, focus on telling it yeah I, I think i think it's really your i think your story is really powerful i think it's really interesting and because it's your story it doesn't have to be um you know like it doesn't have to be a story of great success you know or a story of like great failure and like redemption and all that stuff <laughs> right. it's it's a human story of your human life which is unique as unique as you are and it's i think they're they're like with anyone's life, there are high points, you know, there are low points and there are funny parts, you know, like, like, no, no we're not going to play Paul Loser Hall in the College of New Jersey, like, can't even get there, you know, like, it's a funny story. I think like everyone who hear that story would be like, that's a cool story, you know, it's a funny story, you know, right? So, uh, I, and I, I think it's a story that, 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 that deserves to be told and, you know, needs to be told. It, it's, it, it, I think, you know, you know it, you're, you're doing it, like from you know what it sounds like it's like a journey continued journey of like self-discovery and as part of, the, of that journey you're you're it's almost like a retroactive diary that you're keeping you know what it's a it's a kind of like a memoir right but also but in this memoir like you're also now it's 
you have the benefit of having this lens that you're looking through it, not just being older, wiser, whatever the case may be, but also you mentioned one of the chapters that you, that you posted on the website, it was like, you compare it to like now that through the lens of Buddhism, right? Like how you just like, you know, so now you can see, you know, and analyze things and seeing why you did or why you felt and what you thought and, and how that's going to help you move forward. And I think it, I think it's, I think it's a necessary thing. And I think it's, um, I don't think it, I mean, frankly, like it, it sounds maybe over, oversimplified, but honestly, it doesn't really matter what anyone thinks, you know, like you're doing this for yourself. And I think it's only beneficial. I don't think you're doing it in a self aggrandizing way. Like, look at me, look at my cool story. Like, aren't I cool? And you, you know, it's, you're, you're doing it because you have a story to tell, you know, and but you yourself, you, you're still writing that story, you know what I mean? Because, mm -hmm. and maybe people are helping you remember parts of that story and maybe you're helping yourself remember and, and really understand what, what is your story, you know? And I think the story is the story. Like it's a, it's a, it's a self, it's a thing unto itself. You know what I mean? It's mm -hmm. that Ouroboros, it's that Jormungandr, you know, with the tail and it's, and it's, and it's, uh, you know, <laughs> in its mouth, but like not as an evil serpent, but like it's, it's a thing in and of itself. It doesn't have to justify its existence. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's, right. You know, I, I think I think you should tell your story. You know, you have enough compelling reasons to do so. And I don't think you have a compelling reason not to do it. You know, it's a, <laughs> right. you know? Yeah, you can look at it that way. It's very, very yeah. like physics kind of, right? Yeah. So I think, you know, I think it's a, th it's a thing in, in and of itself. And, you know, if, if people want to read it, it takes off. Awesome, right? More people next to your fire but bottom line is that's not it's just a story that like wants to be told the story just like music sometimes like you get inspiration and you like comes out and you write the song like you know mm -hmm. it comes out and so the story it wants to come out and it <laughs> you can't write itself you know <laughs> <laughs> so it's reliant on you the universe is relying on you to tell uh to, uh, to tell the story and you know and now you're able to do it like if you think about it you know, 100 years, 200, 300 years ago, you may not have had the opportunity to do it. You know, you may not have, have had schooling. You may you have to, you know, you would have been forced to become an apprentice or something and wouldn't mm -hmm. be able to sign your own name, you know? And yeah. like, and, but now you have the opportunity, like you, you can write it down and you can, and whereas before, say someone 200 years ago knew how to write, right? But they couldn't get it published you know what i mean right and and now and now you can you can get published in a digital format or in paperback format and in and of itself that's a huge accomplishment you know what i mean it's and it's it's yeah. an opportunity that's just it's just there you know and um i think the detractions that are like oh why are you doing this so oh, well why not <laughs> like yeah it's, it's a story that wants to be told and you have you have the you're very fortunate to have not just the means we're none of us are like men of means we have all this like whatever it's but it's not a frivolous thing it's like you have the opportunity to do it and you you have you have you afforded the luxury of time whether it's because of the pandemic you know what i mean mm -hmm. or whatever the case may be or but you afforded yourself this this little bit of time that you're taking to have some introspection and have and to write this thing and a lot of people don't have that and so for you to have that time and not to do something with it, whether it be music or, or writing the book or telling a story, you know, then it's kind of that, that, that time is kind of maybe wasted otherwise, you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. sure, missed the opportunity. So, if... Yeah, missed opportunity, exactly. You know, you're a creative person, you're, you're, you're creating, you know what I mean? And you're not like just creating content for clicks, you know, you're, mm -hmm. you're, you're creating, you're, you're creating, you know what I mean? You're like, you're creating things that are that have passion and power and truth to them not just something that's gonna you know content. yeah like, right 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 no I, I definitely appreciate that man yeah is there sure. any part of your story that uh you'd like to share any part of your, i'm sorry we didn't get more into yours no, we no, could no, always do another another interview or 10 of course yeah yeah no but, um but i yeah um, but thank you for allowing me to tell, talk about my story. Oh, of course, of course. No, listen, it, it's been it's been like a, a like a, 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 real, a real pleasure chatting with you. 
you know, maybe <laughs> like the, uh, down the road we'll do a part two or something. We'll talk, we'll talk more about music, you know, or, or <laughs> like <laughs> other stuff like that. But, but yeah. this has been really like, it's just a really good talk to really like, uh, uh, not just fun to catch up and stuff, but also fun to talk about, you know, just the, just the meaning, like why we, you know, who we are, how we got here, where mm -hmm. we're going and, uh, and how sometimes in the conversation, you know, like you, you give, you give voice to things that you were thinking, you know what I mean? You're like, you verbalize it and you, you manifest it, you know, like you mm -hmm. manifest your destiny by speaking it into, into reality. So I think it's, mm -hmm. I think, you know, I think it's really good to talk, to, to talk it out, you know, it's a, uh, and I really enjoy this thought. Yeah. And I, I really appreciate when I reached out to you and, and you sent me uh, information about this memory I was wondering about that we shared and then, you told your life story in that, that email. And I was like, man, and I could tell you enjoyed it, or at least you got something out of it. And I'm like, yeah. it's just so important for us as human beings, if you can, if you could just kind of like, not, not talking to you, I'm just saying yeah. if, if, if we can just choose to like say, hey, you know, my life is pretty interesting. Let, let's look, let's dig a little bit deeper. And we don't yeah. have to get into like the dark things if we don't want to just like no, no, no. see how the pieces connect and yeah, you know, and then I'm sure you know it's probably pretty interesting for you to see um, how your musical journey took shape because I guess that was a musical context in that case. Yeah, absolutely. No, I, I think it's 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 a it's a fascinating thing to uh, to kind of like go down memory lane, but also to now that having the benefit of time and the benefit of hindsight, you know, like to um, to analyze it, you know, and kind of and see like how we got here, you know, what, what, what interesting things we went through to get here and, and what does it all mean, you know? And mm -hmm. we may not have all the answers, you know, like, and, mm -hmm. uh, but in talking, we may get some, maybe instead of answers, we get more interesting questions, you know, which is like, <laughs> and maybe that's what it's all about, you know? It's, uh, <laughs> you know, like, I think yeah. that, 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 that's what it's about. Johnny, I, I really, cool. uh, yeah, I, I really enjoyed our talk. Maybe down the line we'll do we'll, we'll do a part two or something. Yeah. Yeah, sounds good. Mm -hmm. Okay, man. I right, mean, have a good night. Thank you so much. Take it easy. Be well. Bye.